Chapter Six of Ravensdene Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Secret theft. I handed the telegram back to the police inspector with a glance that took in the faces of all three men. It was evident that they were thinking the same thought that had flashed into my own mind. The inspector put it into words. This, he said in a low voice, tapping the bit of flimsy paper with his finger, this throws a light on the affair of this morning. No ordinary crime, that, gentlemen. When two brothers are murdered on the same night, at places hundreds of miles apart, it signifies something out of the common. Somebody has had an interest in getting rid of both men. Wasn't this Noah Quick mentioned in some paper you found on Salter Quick, I asked? An envelope, replied the inspector. We have it, of course. Landlord, so I took it to mean, of the Admiral Parker, Holloway Street, Devonport. I wired to the police authorities there, telling them of Salter Quick's death, and asking them to communicate at once with Noah. Their answer is this. It'll be at Devonport that the secret lies, observed Mr. Cazalet suddenly. Ay, that's where you'll be seeking for news. We've got none here about our affair, remarked the inspector. I set all my available staff to work as soon as I got back to headquarters this forenoon, and up to the time I set off to show you this, Mr. Raven, we'd learned nothing. It's a queer thing, but we haven't come across anybody who saw this man after he left you, Mr. Middlebrook, yesterday afternoon. You say he turned inland, towards Denwick, when he left you after coming out of Clague's place. Well, my men have inquired in every village and at every farmstead and wayside cottage within an area of ten or twelve miles, and we haven't had a word of him. Where did he go? Whom did he come across? I should say that's obvious, said I. He came across the man of whom he heard at the Mariner's Joy, the man who, like himself, was asking for information about an old churchyard in which people called Netherfield are buried. We've heard all about that from the man who told him, Jim Gelthwaite, the drover, replied the inspector. He's told us of his meeting with such a man a night or two ago, but we can't get any information on that point either. Nobody else seems to have seen that man any more than they've seen Salter Quick. I suppose there are places along this coast where a man might hide, I suggested. Caves now, put in Mr. Cazalet. There may be, admitted the inspector. Of course, I shall have the coast searched. Aye, but you'll not find anything now, affirmed Mr. Cazalet. Yon man, that Jim the drover told of, he might be hiding there, or there in a cave, or some out-of-the-way place, of which there's plenty in this part, till he did the deed, but when it was once done he'd be away. The railway's not that far, and there's early morning trains going north and south. "'We've been at the railway folk at all the near stations,' remarked the inspector. "'They could tell nothing. It seems to me,' he continued, turning to Mr. Raven, and nodding sidewise at Mr. Cazalet, that this gentleman hits the nail on the head when he says it's to Devonport that will be turning for explanations. I'm coming to the conclusion that the whole affair has been engineered from that quarter. Ay, said Mr. Cazalet, laconically confident, ye learn more about Salter when ye hear more about Noah, and it's a very bonny mystery and with an uncommonly deep bottom to it. I've wired to Devonport for full particulars about the affair there, said the inspector. No doubt I shall have them by the time our inquest opens to-morrow. I forget whether these particulars had reached him, when next morning Mr. Raven, Mr. Cazalet, the gamekeeper Tarver, and myself walked across the park to the wayside inn to which Salter Quick's body had been removed, and where the coroner was to hold his inquiry. I remembered, however, that nothing was done that morning beyond a merely formal opening of the proceedings, and that a telegram was received from the police at Devonport, in which it was stated that they were unable to find out if the two brothers had any near relations. No one there knew of any. Altogether, I think, 
nothing was revealed that day beyond what we knew already and so far as i remember matters no light was thrown on either murder for some time but i was so much interested in the mystery surrounding them that i carefully collected all the newspaper accounts concerning the murder at saltash and that at ravensdean court and pasted the clippings into a book and from these i can now give something like a detailed account of all that was known of salter and noah quick previous to the tragedies of that spring somewhere about the end of the year nineteen ten noah quick hailing evidently from nowhere in particular but equally evidently being in possession of plenty of cash became licensee of a small tavern called the admiral parker in a back street in devonport it was a fully licensed house and much frequented by seamen noah quick was a thick-set sturdy middle-aged man reserved taciturn very strict in his attention to business a steady sober man keen on money matters he was a bachelor keeping an elderly woman as housekeeper a couple of stout women servants a barmaid and a potman his house was particularly well conducted it was mentioned at the inquest on him that the police had never once had any complaint in reference to it and that noah who had to deal with a rather rough class of customers was peculiarly adept in keeping order one witness indeed said that having had opportunities of watching him he had formed the opinion that noah before going into the public house business had held some position of authority and was accustomed to obedience everything seemed to be going very well with him and the admiral parker when in february nineteen twelve his brother salter quick made his appearance in devonport nobody knew anything about salter quick except that he was believed to have come to devonport from wapping or rotherhithe or somewhere about those thames side quarters he was very like his brother in appearance and in character except that he was more sociable and more talkative he took up his residence at the admiral parker and he and noah evidently got on together very well they were even affectionate in manner toward each other they were often seen in devonport and in plymouth in company but those who knew them best at this time noted that they never paid visits to nor received visits from any one coming within the category of friends or relations and one man giving evidence at the inquest on noah quick said that he had some recollection that salter in a moment of confidence had once told him that he and noah were orphans and hadn't a blood relation in the world according to all that was brought out matters went quite smoothly and pleasantly at the admiral parker until the fifth of march nineteen twelve three days it will be observed before i myself left london for ravensdean court on that day salter quick who had a banking account at the plymouth bank to which he had been introduced by noah who also banked there cashed a cheque for sixty pounds that was in the morning in the early afternoon he went away remarking to the barmaid at his brother's inn that he was first going to london and then north noah accompanied him to the railway station as far as any one knew salter was not burdened by any luggage even by a handbag after he had gone things went on just as usual at the admiral parker neither the housekeeper nor the barmaid nor the potman could remember that the place was visited by any suspicious characters nor that its landlord showed any signs of having any trouble or any extraordinary business matters everything was as it should be when on the evening of the ninth of march the very day on which i met salter quick on the northumbrian coast noah told his housekeeper and barmaid that he had to go over to saltash to see a man on business and should be back about closing time he went away about seven o'clock but he was not back at closing time the potman sat up for him until midnight he was not back then and none of his people at the admiral parker heard any more of him until just after breakfast next morning when the police came and told them that their employer's body had been found at a lonely spot on the bank of the river a little above saltash and that he had certainly been murdered 
There were some points of similarity between the murders of Salter Quick and Noah Quick. The movements and doings of each man were traceable up to a certain point, after which nothing whatever could be discovered respecting them. As regards Noah Quick, he had crossed the river between Keam and Saltash by the ferry-boat, landing just beneath the great bridge which links Devon with Cornwall. It was then nearly dark, but he was seen and spoken to by several men who knew him well. He was seen, too, to go up the steep street towards the head of the queer old village. There he went into one of the inns, had a glass of whisky at the bar, exchanged a word or two with some men sitting in the parlour, and after a while, glancing at his watch, went out, and was never seen again alive. His dead body was found next morning at a lonely spot on an adjacent creek by a fisherman. Like Salter, he had been stabbed, and in similar fashion. And as in Salter's case, robbery of money and valuables had not been the murderer's object. Noah Quick, when found, had money on him, gold, silver, he was also wearing a gold watch and chain, and a diamond ring. All these things were untouched, as if the murderer had felt contemptuous of them. But here again was a point of similarity in the two crimes. Noah Quick's pocket had been turned out, the lining of his waistcoat had been slashed and slit, his thick reefer jacket had been torn off him and subjected to a similar search, its lining was cut to pieces, and it and his overcoat were found flung carelessly over the body. Close by lay his hard felt hat. The lining had been torn out. This, according to the evidence given at the inquests, and to the facts collected by the police at the places concerned, was all that came out. There was not the slightest clue in either case. No one could say what became of Salter Quick after he left me outside the mariner's joy. No one knew where Noah Quick went when he walked out of the Saltash Inn into the darkness. At each inquest, a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown was returned, and the respective coroners uttered some platitudes about coincidence and mystery and all the rest of it. But from all that had transpired, it seemed to me that there were certain things to be deduced, and I find that I tabulated them at the time, writing them down at the end of the newspaper clippings as follows. 1. Salter and Noah Quick were in possession of some secret. 2. They were murdered by men who wished to get possession of it for themselves. 3. The actual murders were probably two members of a gang. 4 gang, if a gang, and murderers were at large, and if they had secured possession of the secret, would be sure to make use of it. Out of this arose the question, what was the secret? Something, I had no doubt whatever, that related to money. But what and how? I exercised my speculative faculties a good deal at the time over this matter, and I could not avoid wondering about Mr. Cazalet and the yew hedge affair. He never mentioned it. I was afraid and nervous about telling him what I had seen. Nor for some time did he mention his tobacco-box labours. Indeed, I don't remember that he mentioned them directly at all. But about the time that the inquests on the two murdered men came to an end, I observed that Mr. Cazalet, most of whose time was devoted to his numismatic work, was spending his leisure in turning over whatever books he could come across at Ravensdean Court which related to local history and topography. He was also studying old maps, charts and the like. Also he got from London the latest ordnance map. I saw him studying that with deep attention. Yet he said nothing until one day, coming across me in the library alone, he suddenly plumped me with the question. Middlebrook, said he, the name which that poor man mentioned to you as you talked with him on the cliff was Netherfield? Netherfield, said I, that was it, Netherfield. He said there were Netherfields buried hereabouts, he asked. Just so, in some churchyard or other, I answered. What of it, Mr. Cazalet? He helped himself to a pinch of snuff, 
as if to assist his thoughts well said he presently and it's a queer thing that at the time of the inquest nobody ever thought of inquiring if there is such a churchyard and such graves why didn't you suggest it i asked i'd rather find it out for myself said he with a knowing look and if you want to know i've been trying to do so but i've looked through every local history there is and i think the late john christopher raven collected every scrap of printed stuff relating to this corner of the country that's ever left a press and i can't find any reference to such a name parish registers i suggested ay i thought of that he said some of them have been printed and i've consulted those that have without result and middlebrook i'm more than ever convinced that yon dead man knew what he was talking about and that there's dead and gone netherfields lying somewhere in this quarter and that the secret of his murder is somehow to be found in their ancient tombs ay he took another big pinch of snuff and looked at me as if to find out whether or no i agreed with him then i let out a question mr cazalet have you found out anything from your photographic work on that tobacco-box lid i asked you thought you might much to my astonishment he turned and shuffled away i'm not through with that matter yet he answered it's progressing i told miss raven of this little conversation she and i were often together in the library we often discussed the mystery of the murders what was there really on the lid of the tobacco-box she asked anything that could actually arouse curiosity i think mr cazalet exaggerated their importance i replied but there were certainly some marks scratches which seemed to have been made by design and what she asked again did mr cazalet think they might mean heaven knows i answered some deep and dark clue to quick's murder i suppose i wish i had seen the tobacco-box she remarked interesting anyway that's easy enough said i the police have it and all the rest of quick's belongings if we walked over to the police station the inspector would willingly show it to you i saw that this proposition attracted her she was not beyond feeling something of the fascination which is exercised upon some people by the inspection of the relics of strange crimes let us go then she said this afternoon i had a mind myself to have another look at that tobacco-box mr cazalet's hints about it and his mysterious secrecy regarding his photographic experiments made me inquisitive so after lunch that day miss raven and i walked across country to the police station where we were shown into the presence of the inspector who in the midst of his politeness frankly showed his wonder at our pilgrimage we have come with an object said i giving him an informing glance miss raven like most ladies is not devoid of curiosity she wishes to see that metal tobacco-box which was found on salter quick the inspector laughed oh he exclaimed the thing that old gentleman what's his name mr cazalet was so keen about photographing why i don't know i saw nothing but two or three surface scratches inside the lid has he discovered anything that i answered is only known to mr cazalet himself he preserves a strict silence on that point he is very mysterious about the matter it is his secrecy and his mystery that makes miss raven inquisitive well remarked the inspector indulgently it's a curiosity that can be very easily satisfied i've got all quick's belongings here just as they were put together after being exhibited before the coroner he unlocked a cupboard and pointed to two handles one a large one was done up in linen the other a small one in a wrapping of canvas that he continued pointing to the linen covered package contains his clothing this his effects his money watch and chain and so on it's sealed as you can see but we can put fresh seals on after breaking these very kind of you to take so much trouble said miss raven all to satisfy a mere whim 
the inspector assured her that it was no trouble and broke the seals of the small carefully wrapped package there neatly done up were the dead man's effects even down to his pipe and pouch his money was there notes gold silver copper there was a stump of lead pencil and a bit of string every single thing found upon him had been kept but the tobacco box was not there i i don't see it exclaimed the inspector how's this he turned the things over again and yet again there was no tobacco box and at that evidently vexed and perplexed he rang a bell and asked for a particular constable who presently entered the inspector indicated the various properties didn't you put these things together when the inquest was over he demanded they were all lying on the table at the inquest we showed them there i told you to put them up and bring them here and seal them i did sir answered the man i put together everything that was on that table at once the package was never out of my hands till i got here and sealed it sergeant brown and myself counted the money sir the money's all right observed the inspector but there's a metal box a tobacco box missing do you remember it can't say that i do sir replied the constable i packed up everything that was there the inspector nodded a dismissal when we were alone again he turned to miss raven and me with a queer expression that box has been abstracted at the inquest he said now then by whom and why End of chapter 6chapter seven of ravenstein court by j s fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain yellow face it was very evident that the inspector was considerably puzzled not to say upset by the disappearance of the tobacco box and i fancied that i saw the real reason of his discomfiture he had pooh-poohed mr cazalet's almost senile eagerness about the thing treating his request as of no importance now he suddenly discovered that somebody had conceived a remarkable interest in the tobacco box and had cleverly annexed it under his very eyes and he was angry with himself for his lack of care and perception i was not indisposed to banter him a little the second of your questions might be easily answered i said the thing has been appropriated because somebody believes as Mr. Cazalet evidently does, or did, that there may be a clue in those scratches or marks on the inside of the lid. But as to who it was that believed this, and managed to secrete the box, that's a far different matter. He was thinking, and presently he nodded his head. I can call to mind everybody who sat round the table where these things were laid out, he remarked confidently. There were two or three officials, like myself, there was our surgeon and Dr. Lorimore, two or three of the country gentlemen, all magistrates, all well known to me, and at the foot of the table there were a couple of reporters. I know them, too, well enough. Now who, out of that lot, would be likely to steal, for that's what it comes to, this tobacco box? A thing that had scarcely been mentioned, if at all, during the proceedings. Well, I don't know, I remarked but you're forgetting one thing inspector that's curiosity he looked at me blankly clearly he did not understand neither i saw did miss raven there are some people i continued who have an itching perhaps a morbid desire to collect and possess relics mementos of crime and criminals i know a man who has a cabinet filled with such things very proud of the fact that he owns a flute which once belonged to charles pease a purse that was found on Frank Muller, a reputed riding-whip of Dick Turpin's and the like. How do you know that one or other of the various men who sat round the table you're talking of hasn't some such mania, and appropriated the tobacco-box as a memento of the Ravensdean court mania? I don't know, he replied, but I don't think it likely. I know the lot of them, more or less, and I think they've all too much sense all the same the thing's gone i remarked and you'll excuse me for saying it 
you're a bit concerned by its disappearance i am he said frankly and i'll tell you why it's just because no particular attention was drawn to it at the inquest so far as i remember it was barely mentioned if it was it was only as one item an insignificant one amongst more important things the money the watch and chain and so on but somebody somebody there considered it of so much importance as to appropriate it therefore it is just what i thought it wasn't a matter of moment i ought to have taken more care about it from the time mr cazalet first drew my attention to those marks inside the lid you're sure that it was on the table at the inquest i suggested i'm sure of that he replied with conviction for i distinctly remember laying out the various objects myself when the inquest was over i told the man you've just seen to put them all together and to seal the package when he brought it back here no that tobacco box was picked up stolen off that table then there's more in the matter that lies on the surface said i evidently said he he looked dubiously from miss raven to myself i suppose the old gentleman mr cazalet is to be trusted i mean you don't think that he's found out anything with his photography and is keeping it dark miss raven and myself i replied know nothing whatever of mr cazalet except that he is a famous authority on coins and medals a very remarkable person for his age and mr raven's guest as to his keeping the result of his investigations dark i should say that no one could do that sort of thing better ay so i guessed muttered the inspector i wish he'd tell us though if he has discovered anything but i suppose he'll take his time precisely said i men like mr cazalet do time is regarded by men of his peculiar temperament in somewhat different fashion to the way in which we younger folk regard it having come a long way along the road of life they refuse to be hurried well i suppose you'll make some inquiries about that box by the way if it's not a professional secret have you heard any more of the affair at saltash they haven't found out another thing he answered with a shake of the head that's as big a mystery as this what do you think from your standpoint of the two affairs i asked more for the delectation of miss raven than for my own satisfaction i knew she was curious about the double mystery have you formed any conclusion i've thought a great deal about it he replied it seems to me that the two brothers salter and noah quick were men who had what's commonly called a past and that there was some strange secret in it probably one of money i think that in their last days they were tracked shadowed whatever you like to call it by some old associates of theirs who murdered them in the expectation of getting hold of something papers or what not and what i would like to know is why did salter quick come down here to this particular bit of the north country he said to look for the graves of his ancestors on his mother's side the netherfields i answered ah well remarked the inspector almost triumphantly i know he did but i've had the most careful inquiries made there isn't such a name in any churchyard in these parts there isn't such a name in any parish register between Almouth Bay and Fenham Flats, and that's a pretty good stretch of country. I set to work on those investigations as soon as you told me about your first meeting with Salter Quick, and every beneficed clergyman and parish clerk in the district and further afield has been at work. The name of Netherfield is absolutely unknown in the past or present." and yet suddenly broke in miss raven it was not salter quick alone who was seeking the graves of the netherfields there was another man the inspector gave her an appreciative look the most mysterious feature of the whole case he exclaimed you're right miss raven there was another man asking for the same information who was he where is he if i could only clap a hand on him you think you'd be clapping a hand on salter quick's murderer i said sharply to my surprise he gave me an equally sharp look 
and shook his head. "'I'm not at all sure of that, Mr. Middlebrook,' he answered quietly. "'Not at all sure. But I think I could get some information out of him that I should be very glad to secure.' Miss Raven and I rose to leave. The inspector accompanied us to the door of the police station, and as we were thanking him for his polite attentions, a man came along the street and paused close by us, looking inquiringly at the building from which we had just emerged and at our companion's smart semi-uniform. Finally, as we were about to turn away, he touched his cap. "'Begging your pardon,' he said, "'is this here the police office?' There was a suggestion in the man's tone which made me think that he had come there with a particular object, and I looked at him more attentively. He was a shortish, thick-set man, hound-faced, frank of eye and lip, no beauty, for he had a shock of sandy red hair and three or four days' stubble on his cheeks and chin. Yet his apparent frankness and a certain steadiness of gaze set him up as an honest fellow. His clothing was rough. There were bits of straw, hay, wood about it, as if he were well acquainted with farming life. In his right hand he carried a stout ash-plant stick. "'You are right, my friend,' answered the inspector. "'It is. What are you wanting?' The man looked up the steps at his informant, with a glance in which there was a decided sense of humour. Something in the situation seemed to amuse him. "'You'll not know me,' he replied. "'My name's Beeman, James Beeman. "'I come from near York. "'I'm to chap as were mentioned by one of the witnesses at the inquest "'on that strange man that were murdered hereabouts. "'I should have called to see you about the matter before now, "'but I've nobbit just come back into this part of the country. "'I've been away up in the Cheviot Hills there.' "'Oh,' said the inspector. "'And what mention was made of you?' James Beeman showed a fine set of teeth, in a grin that seemed to stretch completely across his homely face. "'I'm the chap as was spoken of as asking about the graves of the Netherfield family,' he answered. "'You know, on the roadside one night, off a fellow that I chanced to meet were outside Lesbury. That's who I am.' The inspector turned to Miss Raven and myself, with a look which meant more than he could express in words. "'Talk about coincidence,' he whispered. "'This is the very man we just mentioned. "'Come back to my office and hear what he's got to tell me. "'Follow me,' he continued, beckoning the caller. "'I'm much obliged to you for coming.' "'Now,' he continued, when all four of us were within his room, "'what can you tell me about that? "'What do you know about the grave of the Netherfields?' Beeman laughed, shaking his round head. Now that his old hat was removed, the fiery hue of his poll was almost alarming in its crudeness of hue. Not, he said, not at all. I'll tell you all about it. That's what I've come here for, hearing as you were wondering who I was and what had come of me. I come up here, yes, it were on the 6th of March, to see about some sheep stock for our master, Mr. Dimbleby and I put up for the first night at a temperance in Alwick yonder. But, of course, temperances is all right for sleeping and breakfasting, but not for naught else. So when I teed there, I went down to the street for a comfortable public, where I could smoke my pipe and have a glass or two. And while I was there, a man come in it, from his description in the papers, would be the fellow that were murdered. I didn't talk none to him, but after a bit I heard him talking to the landlord and after a deal of talk about fishing hereabouts, I heard him asking the landlord, as seemed to be a great fisherman and knew all the countryside, if he knew any places, churchyards, where there were netherfields buried. He talked so much about them, as it got the name right fixed in my mind. The next day I had business outside Alnwick, at one or two farms, and that night I made further north to put up at Embleton. Now then, as I were walking that way, after dark, I chanced in with a man near Lesbury, and walked with him a piece, and I asked him, finding he were a native, if he knew aught of the Netherfield graves. And that'd be the man I tell you at that he met such a person. All right, I'm the person. 
then you merely asked the question out of curiosity suggested the inspector ay just because i'd heard the strange man inquire assented beeman i just wondered if it were some family or what they call consequence you never saw the man again whom you speak of as having seen at alnwick the inspector asked and had no direct conversation with him yourself never saw the fellow again or had a word with him replied beeman he had his glass or two of rum and went away but i reckon he was the man who was murdered and where have you been yourself since the time you tell us about asked the inspector right away across country answered beeman readily i went across to chillingham and wooler then forward to some farms into cheviots and back by alnham and whittingham to alnwick and then i heard all about this affair so i thought it good to come and tell you what bit i knew i'm much obliged to you mr beeman said the inspector you've cleared up something at any rate are you going to stay longer in the neighbourhood i shall be here leastways at alnwick yonder at the temperance for two or three days yet while i've collected some sheep together that i've bought for our master on one farm and another replied beeman then i shall be away but if you ever want me at disizes or what of that sort my directions is james beeman foreman to mr thomas dimbleby cross houses manor york when this candid and direct person had gone the inspector looked at miss raven and me with glances that indicated a good deal that settles one point and seems to establish another he remarked significantly salter quick was not murdered by somebody who had come into these parts on the same errand as himself he was murdered by somebody who was here already and who met him i suggested and who met him assented the inspector and now i'm more anxious than ever to know if there is anything in that tobacco-box theory of mr cassellette's couldn't you young people cajole mr cassellette into telling you a little surely he would oblige you miss raven there are moments when mr cassellette is approachable replied miss raven there are others at which i should soon as think of asking a question of the sphinx wait said i mr cassellette i firmly believe knows something and now you know more than you did one mystery has gone by the board it leaves the main one all the blacker answered the inspector who of all the folk in these parts is one to suspect yet it would seem that salter quick found somebody here to whom his presence was so decidedly unwelcome that there was nothing for it but swift and certain death why well death ensures silence miss raven and i took our leave for the second time we walked some distance from the police station before exchanging a word i do not know what she was thinking of as for myself i was speculating on the change in my opinion brought about by the rough-and-ready statement of our brusque yorkshireman for until then i had firmly believed that the man who had accosted our friend of the mariner's joy jim gelthwaite the drover was the man who had murdered salter quick my notion was that this man whoever he was had foregathered somewhere with quick that they were known to each other and had a common object and that he had knifed quick for purposes of his own and now that idea was exploded and so far as i could see the search for the real assassin was yet to begin suddenly miss raven spoke i suppose it's barely possible that the murderer was present at the inquest she asked half timidly as if afraid of my ridiculing her suggestion quite possible said i the place was packed to the doors with all sorts of people but why i thought perhaps that he might have contrived to abstract that tobacco-box knowing that as long as it was in the hands of the police there might be some clue to his identity she suggested good notion i replied but there's just one thing against it if the murderer had known that if he felt that he'd have secured the box when he searched quick's clothing as he undoubtedly did of course she admitted i ought to have thought of that 
but there are such a lot of things to think of in connection with this case threads interwoven with each other you've been thinking much about it i asked she made no reply for a moment and i waited wondering i don't think it's a very comfortable thing to know that one's had a particularly brutal murder at one's very door and that for all one knows the murderer may still be close at hand she said at last there's such a disagreeable feeling of uneasiness about this affair i know that uncle francis is most awfully upset by it i looked at her in some surprise i had not seen any marked signs of concern in mr raven i hadn't observed that i said perhaps not she answered but i know him better he's an unusually nervous man do you know that since this happened he's taken to going round the house every night examining doors and windows and he's begun to carry a revolver the last statement made me think why should mr raven expect or if not expect be afraid of any attack on himself but before i could make any comment on my companion's information my attention to the subject was diverted all that afternoon the weather had been threatening to break there was thunder about and now with startling suddenness a flash of lightning was followed by a sharp crack and that on the instant by a heavy downpour of rain i glanced at miss raven's light dress early spring though it was the weather had been warm for more than a week and she had come out in things that would be soaked through in a moment but just then we were close to an old red brick house which stood but a yard or two back from the road and was divided from it by nothing but a strip of garden it had a deep doorway and without ceremony i pushed open the little gate in front and drew miss raven within its shelter we had not stood there many seconds our back to the door which i never opened when a soft mellifluous voice sounded close to my startled ear will you not step inside and shelter from the storm twisting round sharply i found myself staring at the slit-like eyes an old parchment-hued face of a smiling Chinaman. End of chapter 7chapter 8 of Ravenstein Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Was it a woman? Had Miss Raven and I suddenly been caught up out of that little coast village? and transported to the far east on a magic carpet to be set down in the twinkling of an eye on some oriental threshold we could scarcely have been more surprised than we were at the sight of that bland smiling countenance for the moment i was at a loss to think who and what the man could be he was in the dress of his own country a neat close-fitting high-buttoned blue jacket there was a little cap on his head and a pigtail dependent from behind it I was not sufficiently acquainted with Chinese costumes to gather any idea of his rank or position from these things. For aught I knew to the contrary, he might be a Mandarin who for some extraordinary reason had found his way to this out-of-the-world spot. And my answer to his courteous invitation doubtless sounded confused and awkward. "'Oh, thank you,' I said. "'Pray don't let us put you to any trouble. If we may just stand under your porch a moment.' He stood a little aside, waving us politely into the hall behind him. Dr. Lorimer would be very angry with me if I allowed a lady and gentleman to stand at his door and did not invite them into his house, he said, in the same even mellifluous tones, please to enter. Oh, is this Dr. Lorimer's, I said? Thank you. We'll come in. Is Dr. Lorimer at home? Presently, he answered, he is in the village. He closed the door as we entered, passed us with a bow, preceded us along the hall, and threw open the door of a room which looked out on a trim garden at the rear of the house. Still smiling and bland, he invited us to be seated, and then, with another bow, left the room, apparently walking on velvet. Miss Raven and I glanced at each other. "'So Dr. Lorimore has a Chinese manservant,' she said, 
how picturesque hm i muttered she gave me a questioning half amused glance and dropped her voice don't you like easterns she whispered i like em in the east i replied in northumberland they don't shall we say they don't fit in with the landscape i think he fits in here she retorted looking round this is a bit oriental she was right in that the room into which we had been ushered was certainly suggestive of what one had heard of india there were fine indian rugs on the floor ivories and brasses in the cabinets the curtains were of fabric that could only have come out of some eastern bazaar there was a faint curious scent of sandalwood and of dried rose leaves and on the mantelpiece where in english households a marble clock generally stands reposed a peculiarly ugly hindu god cross-legged hideous of form whose baleful eyes seemed to follow all our movements yes i admitted reflectively i think he fits in here dr lorrimore said he had been in india for some years didn't he he appears to have brought some of it home with him i suppose this is his drawing-room said miss raven now if it only looked out on palm trees and and all the other things that one associates with india just so said i what it does look out on however is a typical english garden on which at present about a ton of rain is descending and we are nearly three miles from ravenstein court oh but it won't keep on like that for long she said and i suppose if it does that we can get some sort of a conveyance perhaps dr lorrimore has a broom that he'd lend us i don't think that's very likely said i the country practitioner i think is more dependent on a bicycle than on a broom but here is dr lorrimore i had just caught sight of him as he entered his garden by a door set in its ivy-covered wall he ran hastily up the path to the house within a minute or two divested of his mackintosh he opened the door of our room so glad you were near enough to turn in here for shelter he exclaimed shaking hands with us warmly i see that neither of you expected rain now i did and i went out prepared we made for the first door we saw said miss raven but we'd no idea it was yours dr lorrimore and do tell me the chinese she continued in a whisper is he your man-servant lorrimore laughed rubbing his hands together that day he was not in the solemn raven-hued finery in which he had visited ravensdene court instead he wore a suit of grey tweed in which i thought he looked rather younger and less impressive than in black but he was certainly no ordinary man and as he stood there smiling at miss raven's eager face i felt conscious that he was the sort of somewhat mysterious rather elusive figure in which women would naturally be interested manservant he said with another laugh he's all the servant i've got wing he's two or three other monosyllabic patronymics but wing suffices is an invaluable person he's a model cook valet launderer general factotum there's nothing that he can't or won't do for making the most perfect curries i must have mr raven to try them against the achievements of his man to taking care about the halfpennies when he goes his round of the tradesmen oh he's a treasure i assure you miss raven you could go the round of this house at any moment without finding a thing out of place or a speck of dust in any corner a model you brought him from india i suppose said i i brought him from india yes he answered he'd been with me there some time before i left so of course we're thoroughly used to each other and does he really like living here asked miss raven in such absolutely different surroundings oh well i think he's a pretty good old hand at making the best of the moment laughed lorrimore he's a philosopher deep inscrutable in short he's chinese he has his own notions of happiness at present he's supremely happy in getting you some tea 
you mightn't think it but that saffron-faced eastern can make an english plum cake that will put the swellest london pastry cook to shame you must try it the chinaman presently summoned us to tea which he had laid out in another room obviously lorrimore's dining-room there was nothing oriental in that rather it was eminently victorian an affair of heavy furniture steel engravings and an array on the sideboard of what i suppose was old family plate wing ushered us and his master in with due ceremony and left us when the door had closed on him lorrimore gave us an arch glance you see how readily and skilfully that chap adapts himself to the needs of the moment he said now you mightn't think it but this is the very first time i have ever been honoured with visitors to afternoon tea observe how wing immediately falls in with english taste and custom without a word from me out comes the silver teapot the best china the finest linen he produces his choicest plum cake the bread and butter is cut with wafer-like thinness and the tea ah well no englishwoman miss raven can make tea as a chinese manservant can it's quite plain that you've got a treasure in your house dr lorrimore said miss raven but then the chinese are very clever aren't they very remarkable people indeed assented our host shrewd observant penetrative I have often wondered if this man of mine would find any great difficulty in seeing through a brick wall. He would be a useful person, perhaps, in solving the present mystery, said I. The police seem to have got no further. Ah, the quick business, remarked Lorrimore. Hm. Well, as regards that, it seems to me that whatever light is thrown on it will have to be thrown from the other angle, from Devonport. From all that I heard and gathered, it's very evident that what is really wanted is a strict examination into the immediate happenings at Noah Quick's Inn, and also into the antecedents of Noah and Salter. But is there anything fresh? I told him briefly all that had happened that afternoon, of the information given by James Beeman, and of the disappearance of the tobacco box. That's odd, he remarked let's see it was the old gentleman i saw at ravenstein court who had some fancy about that box wasn't it mr cassalet what was his idea now mr cassalet i replied saw or fancied he saw certain marks or scratches within the lid of the box which he took to have some meaning they were he believed made with design with some purpose he thought that by photographing them and then enlarging his photograph he would bring out those marks more clearly and possibly find out what they were really meant for yes said lorrimore well what has he discovered up to now nobody knows said miss raven mr cassalet won't tell us anything that looks as if he had discovered something observed lorrimore but old gentlemen are a little queer and a little vain perhaps he's suddenly going to let loose a tremendous theory and wants to perfect it before he speaks oh well he added almost indifferently i've known a good many murder mysteries in my time out in india and i always found that the really good way of getting at the bottom of them was to go right back as far back as possible if i were the police in charge of these cases i should put one question down before me and do nothing till i'd exhausted every effort to solve it and that would be what i asked this said he what were the antecedents of noah and salter quick you think they had a past suggested miss raven everybody has a past answered lorrimore it may be this it may be that but nearly all the problems of the present have their origin and solution in the past find out what and where those two middle-aged men had been in their time and then there'll be a chance to work forward the rain cleared off soon after we had finished tea and presently miss raven and i took our leave lorrimore informed us that mr raven had asked him to dinner on the following evening he would accordingly see us again very soon 
"'It will be quite an event for me,' he said gaily, as he opened his garden gate. "'I live like an anchorite in this place. A little practice, a very little practice, the folk are scandalously healthy, and a great deal of scientific investigation. That's my lot.' "'But you have a treasure of a servant,' observed Miss Raven. "'Please tell him that his plum-cake was perfection.' The Chinaman was just then standing at the open door, in waiting on his master. Miss Raven threw him a laughing nod, to which he responded with a deep bow. We left them with that curious picture in our minds. Lorimore, essentially English, in spite of his long residence in the East. The Chinaman, bland, suave, smiling. "'A curious pair, and a strange combination,' I remarked as we walked away. That house, at any rate, has a plenitude of brain power in it. What amazes me is that a clever chap like Master Wing should be content to bury his talents in a foreign place, out of the world, to make curries and plum cake. Perhaps he has a faithful devotion to his master, said Miss Raven. Anyway, it's very romantic and picturesque and that sort of thing, to find a real live Chinaman in an English village. I wonder if the poor man gets teased about his queer clothes and his pigtail. Didn't Lorimore say he was a philosopher, said I? Therefore he'll be indifferent to criticism. I dare say he doesn't go about much. That the Chinaman was not quite a recluse, however, I discovered a day or two later, when going along the headlands for a solitary stroll after a stiff day's work in the library, I turned into the mariner's joy for a glass of Clegg's undeniably good ale. Wing was just coming out of the house as I entered it. He was as neat, as bland, and as smiling as when I saw him before. He was still in his blue jacket, his little cap. But he was now armed with a very large umbrella, and on one arm he carried a basket filled with small parcels. Evidently he had been on a shopping expedition. He greeted me with a deep obeisance and respectful smile, and went on his way. I entered the inn, and found its landlord alone in his bar-parlour. "'You get some queer customers in here, Mr. Clegg,' I observed, as he attended to my modest wants. Yet it's not often, I should think, that a real live Chinaman walks in on you.' "'He's been in two or three times, that one,' replied Clegg. "'Chinaman he is, no doubt, sir. "'but it strikes me he must know as much of this country "'as he knows of his own, "'for he speaks our tongue like a native. "'A bit soft and mincing-like, "'but never at a loss for a word. "'Dr. Lorimore's servant, I understand.' "'He has been in Dr. Lorimore's service for some years,' I answered. "'No doubt he's had abundant opportunities "'of picking up the language. "'Still, it's an odd sight to see a Chinaman, pigtail and all in these parts, isn't it? Well, I've had all sorts in here time and again, replied Clegg reflectively. Sailormen mostly. But, he added with a meaning look, of all the lot, that poor chap has got knifed the other week was the most mysterious. What do you make of it, sir? I don't know what to make of it, said I. I don't think anybody knows what to make of it. The police don't, anyhow. "'The police!' he exclaimed with a note of derision. "'Yeah, they're worse than a parcel of old women. "'Have they ever tried? "'Just a bit of service inquiry, and the thing slips past. "'Of course the man was a stranger. "'Nobody cares. That's about it. "'My notion is that the police don't care the value of that match, "'whether the thing's ever cleared up or not. Nine days wonder, you know, Mr. Middlebrook. "'Still, there's a deal of talk about.' "'I suppose you hear a good deal in this parlour of yours?' I suggested. "'Nights, yes,' he said. "'A murder's always a good subject of conversation. "'At first those who come in here of an evening, "'regular set there, in from the village at the back of the cliffs, "'they could talk of naught else, starting first this and that theory. "'It's died down a good deal, to be sure. "'There's been naught new to start it afresh on another tack.' but there is some talk even now. And what's the general opinion, I inquired? I suppose there is one. Aye, well, I couldn't say that there's a general opinion, he answered. 
there's a many opinions and some queer notions too such as what i asked well said he with a laugh as if he thought the suggestion ridiculous there's one that comes nearer being what you might call general than any of the others there's a party of the older men that come here who are dead certain that quick was murdered by a woman a woman i exclaimed whatever makes them think that those footmarks answered Clegg. you'll remember mr middlebrook that there were two sets of prints in the sand thereabouts one was certainly quick's they fitted his boots the other was very light delicate you might call them made without doubt by some light-footed person well some of the folk hereabouts went along to kernwick cove the day of the murder and looked at those prints they say the lighter ones were made by a woman i let my recollections go back to the morning on which i had found quick lying dead on the patch of yellow sand of course i said reflectively those marks are gone now gone ay exclaimed Clegg. long since there's been a good many times washed over that spot since this mr middlebrook but they haven't washed out the fact that a man's life was let out there and whether it was man or woman that stuck that knife into the poor fellow's shoulders it'll come out some day i'm not so sure of that said i there's a goodly percentage of unsolved mysteries of that kind well i do believe in the old saying he declared murder will out what i don't like is the notion that the murderer may be walking about this quarter free unsuspected why i may have served him with a glass of beer what's to prevent it murderers don't carry a label on their foreheads what do you think the police ought to do or ought to have done i asked i think they should have started working backwards he replied with decision i read all i could lay hands on in the newspapers and i came to the conclusion that there was a secret behind those two men come two brothers murdered on the same night hundreds of miles apart that's no common crime mr middlebrook who were these two men noah and salter quick what was their past history that's what the police ought to have busied themselves with if they lost or couldn't pick up the scent here they should have tried far back go back what they should if they want to go forward this was the second time i had heard that advice and i returned to ravensdene court reflecting on it certainly it was sensible who after all were noah and salter quick what was their life story i was wondering how that could be brought to light when having dressed for dinner and i was going downstairs mr cazalet's door opened and he quietly drew me inside his room middlebrook he whispered though he had carefully shut the door you're a sensible lad and i'll acquaint you with the matter this very morning as i was taking my bit of a dip my pocket-book was stolen out of the jacket that i'd left on the shore stolen middlebrook was there anything of great value in it i asked ay there was answered mr cazalet there was that in it which in my opinion might be some sort of a clue to the real truth about yon man's murder end of chapter eight chapter nine of ravensdene court by j s fletcher this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE ENLARGED PHOTOGRAPH I was dimly conscious, in a vague, uncertain fashion, that Mr. Cazalet was going to tell me secrets, that I was about to hear something which would explain his own somewhat mysterious doings on the morning of the murder. A half-excited, anticipating curiosity rose in me, i think he saw it for he signed to me to sit down in an easy-chair close by his bed he himself a queer odd figure in his quaint old-fashioned clothes perched himself on the edge of the bed sit you down middlebrook he said we've some time yet before dinner and i'm wanting to talk to you in private you'll bear in mind there's things i know that i'm not willing as yet to tell to everybody but i'll tell them to you middlebrook for you're a sensible young fellow and we'll take a bit of counsel together 
I, there was that in my pocket-book that might be, I'll not say positively that it was, but that it might be, a clue to the identity of the man that murdered Jan Salter Quick, and I'm sorry now that I've lost it and didn't take more care of it. But, man, who'd have thought that I'd have my pocket-book stolen from under my very nose? And that's a convincing proof that there's uncommonly sharp and clever criminals around us in these parts, Middlebrook. "'You lost your pocket-book while you were bathing, Mr. Cazalet? I asked, wishful to know all his details. He turned on his bed, pointing to a venerable Norfolk jacket, which hung on a peg in a recess by the washstand. I knew it well enough. I had often seen him in it, first thing of a morning. "'It's my custom,' said he, "'to array myself in that old coatie when I go for my bit-dip, you see. It's thick and it's warm, and I've had it twenty years or more. Good tweed it is, and homespun. And whenever I've gone out of here of a morning, I've put my pocket-book in the inside pocket, and laid the coat itself and the rest of my scanty attire on the bank there down at Kernwick Cove while I went in the water. And I did that very same thing this morning, and when I came back to my clothes again, the pocket-book was gone. "'You saw nobody about?' I suggested. "'Nobody,' said he. "'But, Lord, man, I know how easy it was to do the thing. You'll bear in mind that on the right-hand side of that cove the plantation comes right down to the edge of the bit of cliff. Well, a man lurking amongst the shrubs and undergrowth would have nothing to do but reach his arm to the bank, draw my coatie to his nefarious self, and abstract my property. And by the time I was on dry land again, and watering my garments, he'd be a quarter of a mile away. And the clue, I asked. He edged a little nearer to me, and dropped his voice still lower. I'm telling you, he said. Now, you'll let your mind go back to the morning, whereon you found yon man quick, lying dead and murdered on the sand? And you'll remember that before ever you were down at the place, I'd been there before you. You'll wonder how it comes about that I didn't find what you found, but then there's many big rocks and boulders standing well up on that beach, and it's very evident that the corpse was obscured from my view by one or other, and maybe more of them. Anyway, I didn't find Salter Quick, but I did find something that maybe, mind, I'm saying maybe, Middlebrook, had to do with his murder. What, Mr. Cazalet, I asked, though I knew well enough what it was. I wanted him to say and have done with it. His circumlocution was getting wearisome. But he was one of those old men who won't allow their cattle to be hurried, and he went on in his long-winded way. You'll be aware, he continued, that there's a deal of gorse and bramble growing right down to the very edge of the coast thereabouts, Middlebrook. Scrub, that sort of thing. The stuff that if it catches anything loose, anything protruding from, say, the pocket of a garment, will lay hold and stick to it. I, well, on one of those bushes, gorse or bramble, I cannot rightly say which, just within the entrance to the plantation, I saw fluttering in the morning breeze that came sharp and refreshing off the face of the water, a handkerchief. And there was of two sorts of stains on it, caused in the one case by mud, the soft mud of the adjacent beach, and in the other by blood. A smear of blood, as if somebody had wiped blood off his fingers, you'll understand. But it was not that, not the blood, made me give my particular attention to the thing, which I'd picked off with my thumb and finger. It was that I saw at once that this was no common man's property, for there was a crest woven into one corner, and a monogram of initials underneath it, and the stuff itself was a sort that I'm unfamiliar with. It wasn't linen, though it looked like it, and it wasn't silk, for I'm well acquainted with that fabric. Maybe it was a mixture of the two, but it had not been woven or made in any British factory. The thing, Middlebrook, was of foreign origin. "'What were the markings you speak of?' I asked. "'Well, I tell you there was the crest. Anyhow, it was a coronet, or that make of thing,' he answered. "'Woven in one corner, I mean, worked in by hand. And the letters beneath it were a V, 
and a de small at last and a c man that handkerchief was the property of some man of quality and the stains being wet the mud stains at any rate though the smear of blood was dry i gathered that it had been but recently deposited by accident where i found it i reckoned it up this way do you see middlebrook the man who'd left it there had used it on the beach maybe he'd cut his toe bathing or something of that sort or likely a cut finger gathering a shell or a fossil and had thrust it carelessly into a side pocket for a thorn to catch hold of as he passed but there it was and there i found it and what did you do with it mr cazalette i inquired with seeming innocence i'm telling you he replied i had no knowledge you are aware of what lay behind me on the sands i just thought it a queer thing that a man of quality's handkerchief should be there and i slipped it in among my towels to bring it along with me to the house here but i'm wiles given to absent-mindedness and not liking that i should put the blood-stained thing down on my dressing-table there and causing the maids to wonder i thrust it into a hedge as i was passing along till i could go back and examine it at my leisure and when i'd got myself dressed i went back and took it and put it in a stout envelope into my pocket and then you came along middlebrook with your story of the murder and i saw then that before saying a word to anybody i'd keep my own counsel and examine that thing more carefully i gather from all you said that the handkerchief was in the pocket-book you had stolen this morning i suggested you're right in that said he oh it was wrapped up in a bit of oiled paper and in an envelope sealed down and attested in my handwriting middlebrook date and particulars of my discovery of it all all in order ay and there was more letters and papers of my own to be sure and a trifle money banknotes but there was yet another thing that in view of all we know may be a serious thing to have fall into the hands of ill-doers a print middlebrook of the enlarged photograph i got of the inside of the lid of yon dead man's tobacco-box he regarded me with intense seriousness as he made this announcement and not knowing exactly what to say i remained silent ay he continued and it's my distinct and solemn belief that it's that the thief was after you see middlebrook it's been spoken of not widely noised about as you might say but still spoken of and things spread that i was keenly interested in those marks scratches whatever they were on the inside of that lid and got the police to let me make a photograph and it's my impression that there's somebody about who's been keenly anxious to know what results i obtained you really think so said i why who could there be ay man and who could there be with a crest and monogram on his kerchief that had murder yon man the secret way he has he retorted answering my incredulous look with one of triumph tell me that my laddie i'm telling you middlebrook that this was no common murder any more than the murder of the man's own brother down yonder at saltash which is a cornish riverside place and a good four or five hundred miles away was a common ordinary crime man we're living in the very midst of a mystery and that there's bloody-minded eye and bloody-handed men maybe within our gates but surely close by us is as certain to me as that i'm looking at you i thought you believed that salter quick's murderer was miles away before ever salter quick was cold i observed i did and i've changed my mind he answered i'm not thinking it any more and all the less since i was robbed of my venerable pocket-book with those two exhibits of the crime in its wame the murder is about and though he mayn't have thought to get his handkerchief he may have hoped that he'd secure some result of my labours in the photographic line mr cazalet said i what were the results of your labours i don't suppose that the print which was in your pocket-book was the only one you possess you're right there he replied it wasn't if the thief thought he was securing something unique he was mistaken but 
I didn't want him or anybody to get hold of even one print, for as sure as we're living men, Middlebrook, what was on the inside of that lid was a key to something. You forget that the tobacco box itself has been stolen from the police's keeping, I reminded him. And I don't forget anything of the sort, he retorted and the fact you've mentioned makes me all the more assured, my man, that what I say is correct. There's him, or there's them, in all likelihood it's the plural, that's uncommonly anxious, feverishly anxious, to get hold of that key that I suspicion. What were Salter Quick's pockets turned out for? What were the man's clothes slashed and hacked for? Why did whoever slew Noah Quick at Saltash treat the man in similar fashion? It wasn't money the two men were murdered for. No, it was for information, a secret. Or, as I put it before, the key to something. And you believe, really and truly, that this key is in the marks or scratches, or whatever they are, on the lid of the tobacco box? Aye, I do, he exclaimed. And what's more, Middlebrook, I believe I'm a doited old fool. If I contrive to get a good, careful, penetrating look at that box, without saying anything to the police, I should have shown some common sense. But like the blithering old idiot that I am, I spoke my thoughts aloud before a company, and I made a present of an idea to these miscreants. Until I said what I did, the murderous gang that knifed yon two men hadn't a notion that Salter Quick carried a key in his tobacco box. Now they know." You don't mean to suggest that any of the murderers were present when you asked permission to photograph the box, I exclaimed. Impossible! There's very few impossibilities in this world, Middlebrook, he answered. I'm not saying that any of the gang were present in Raven's outhouse yonder, where they carried the poor fellow's body, but there were a dozen or more men heard what I said to the police inspector, like the old fool I was, and saw me taking my photograph and men talk, no matter of what degree they are. Mr. Cazalet, said I, I'd just like to see your results. He got off his bed at that, and going over to a chest of drawers, unlocked one, and took out a writing case from which he presently extracted a sheet of cardboard, whereon he had mounted a photograph, beneath which, on the cardboard, were some lines of explanatory writing in its fine, angular style of calligraphy. This he placed in my hand without a word, watching me silent as I looked at it. I could make nothing of the thing. It looked to me like a series, a very small one, of meaningless scratches, evidently made with the point of a knife, or even by a strong pin on the surface of the metal. Certainly the marks were there, and equally certain they looked to have been made with some intent. But what did they mean? "'What do you make of it, lad?' he inquired after a while. "'Anything?' "'Nothing, Mr. Gazalette,' I replied. "'Nothing whatever.' "'I will, and to be candid, neither do I,' he confessed. "'And yet I'm certain there's something in it. "'Take another look, and consider it carefully.' I looked again. This is what there was to look at. Mere lines, and at the foot of the photograph, Mr. Gazalette's explanatory notes and suggestions. I sat studying this for a few moments. I make nothing of it. It seems to be a plan, but of what? It is a plan, Middlebrook, he answered. A plan of some place, but there I'm done. What place? Somebody that's in the secret to a certain point might know, but who else could? I've speculated a deal on the meaning and significance of those lines and marks, but without success. Yet they're the key to something probably to some place that Salter Quick knew of, I suggested. Ay, and that somebody else wants to know of, he exclaimed. But what place and where? He was asking after a churchyard, said I, suddenly remembering Quick's questions to me and his evident eagerness to acquire knowledge. This may be a rude drawing of a corner of it. Ay, and he wanted the graves of the Netherfields, remarked Mr. Cazalet dryly and I've made myself assured of the fact that there isn't a Netherfield buried anywhere about this region. No, it's my belief that this is a key to some spot in foreign parts, 
and that there's those who are anxious to get hold of it that they'll not stop and haven't stopped at murder and now they've got it they've got or somebody's got your pocket-book i answered but really you know mr cazalet this and the handkerchief mayn't have been the thief's object you see it must be pretty well known that you go down there to bathe every morning and are in the habit of leaving your clothes about and well there may be those who are not particularly honest even in these arcadian solitudes no i'm not with you middlebrook he said somewhere around us there's what i say crafty and bloody murderers but you'll keep all this to yourself for a while and just then the dinner bell rang and he put the photographic print away and we went downstairs together that was the evening on which dr lorrimore was to dine with us we found him in the hall talking to mr raven and his niece joining them we found that their subject of conversation was the same that had just engaged mr cazalet and myself the tobacco box it turned out that the police inspector had been round to lorrimore's house inquiring if lorrimore who with the police surgeon had occupied a seat at the table whereon the quick relics were laid out at the inquest had noticed that now missing and consequently all important object of course i saw it remarked lorrimore narrating this i told him i not only saw it but handled it so too did several other people mr cazalet there had drawn attention to the thing when we were examining the dead man and there was some curiosity about it here mr cazalet standing close by me nudged my elbow to remind me of what he had just said upstairs and i told the inspector something else or rather put him in mind of something he'd evidently forgotten continued lorrimore that inquest or to be precise the adjourned inquest was attended by a good many strangers who had evidently been attracted by mere curiosity there were a lot of people there who certainly did not belong to this neighbourhood and when the proceedings were over they came crowding round that table morbidly inquisitive about the dead man's belongings what easier as i said to the inspector than for some one of them perhaps a curio hunter to quietly pick up that box and make off with it there are people who'd give a good deal to lay a hold of a souvenir of that sort mr raven muttered something about no accounting for tastes and we went into dinner and began to talk of less gruesome things lorrimore was a brilliant and accomplished conversationalist and the time passed pleasantly until as we men were lingering a little over our wine and miss raven was softly playing the piano in the adjoining drawing-room the butler came in and whispered to his master raven turned an astonished face to the rest of us there's the police inspector here now he said and with him a detective from devonport they're anxious to see me and you middlebrook the detective has something to tell end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Ravensdean Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Yellow Sea. I am not sure which or how many of us sitting at that table had ever come into personal contact with the detective. I myself had never met one in my life, but I am sure that Mister Raven's announcement that there was a real live one close at hand immediately excited much curiosity. Miss Raven, in the adjoining room, the door of which was open, caught her uncle's last words, and came in expectantly. I think she, like most of us, wondered what sort of being we were about to see. And possibly there was a shade of disappointment on her face, when the police inspector walked in, followed, not by the secret, subtle, sleuth-hound-like person she had perhaps expected, but by a little, rotund, rather merry-faced man, who looked more like a prosperous cheesemonger or successful draper than an emissary of justice he was just the sort of person you would naturally expect to see with an apron around his comfortable waistline or a pencil stuck in his ear and who was given to rubbing his fat white hands he rubbed them now and smiled wholesale as his companion led him forward 
"'Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Raven,' said the inspector, with an apologetic bow, "'but we are anxious to have a little talk with you and Mr. Middlebrook. "'This is Mr. Scarterfield, from the police at Devonport. "'Mr. Scarterfield has been in charge of the investigations about the affair, "'Noah Quick, you know, down there, and he has come here to make some further inquiries.' Mr. Raven murmured some commonplace about being glad to see his visitors, and with his usual hospitality offered them refreshment. We made room for them at the table at which we were sitting, and some of us, I think, were impatient to hear what Mr. Scarterfield had to tell. But the detective was evidently one of those men who readily adapt themselves to whatever company they are thrown into, and he betrayed no eagerness to get the business until he had lighted one of Mr. Raven's cigars and pledged Mr. Raven in a whisky and soda. Then, equipped and at his ease, he turned a friendly, all-embracing smile on the rest of us. Which, he asked, looking from one to the other, which of these gentlemen is Mr. Middlebrook? The general turning of several pairs of eyes in my direction gave him the information he wanted. We exchanged nods. "'It was you who found Salter Quick,' he suggested, "'and who met him the previous day on the cliffs hereabouts "'and went with him into the mariner's joy?' "'Quite correct,' said I, "'all that. "'I have read up everything that appeared in print "'in connection with the Salter Quick affair,' he remarked. "'It has, of course, a bearing on the Noah Quick business. "'Whatever is of interest in the one is of interest in the other.' "'You think the two affairs one, really, eh?' inquired Mr. Raven. "'One,' declared Scarterfield. "'The object of the man who murdered Noah was the same object as that of the man who murdered Salter. The two murderers are, without doubt, members of a gang. But what gang, and what object? Ah, that's just what I don't know yet.' "'What we were all curious about, of course, was—' what did he know that we did not already know? And I think he saw in what direction our thoughts were turning, for he presently leaned forward on the table and looked around the expectant faces as if to command our attention. "'I had better tell you how far my investigations have gone,' he said quietly. "'Then we shall know precisely where we are, and from what point we can perhaps make a new departure, now that I have come here.' I was put in charge of this case, at least of the Saltash murder, from the first. There's no need for me to go into the details of that now, because I take it that you have all read them, or quite sufficient of them. Now, when the news about Salter Quick came through, it seemed to me that the first thing to do was to find out a very pertinent thing. Who were the brothers Quick? What were their antecedents? What was in their past? the immediate or distant past, likely to lead up to these crimes? A pretty stiff proposition, as you may readily guess, for you must remember each was a man of mystery. No one in our quarter knew anything more of Noah Quick than that he had come to Devonport some little time previous, taken over the license of the Admiral Parker, conducted his house very well, and had the reputation of being a quiet, close, reserved sort of man who was making money. As to Salter, nobody knew anything except that he had been visiting Noah for some time. Family ties, the two men evidently have none. Not a soul has come forward to claim relationship. And there has been wide publicity. "'Do you think Quick was the real name?' asked Mr. Cazalet, who from the first had been listening with rapt attention. "'Mayn't it have been an assumed name?' "'Well, sir,' replied Mr. Scarterfield, "'I thought of that. "'But you must remember that full descriptions "'of the two brothers appeared in the press, "'and that portraits of both were printed alongside. "'Nobody came forward recognising them, "'and there has been a powerful, a most powerful, "'inducement for their relations to appear, "'never mind whether they were Quick or Brown or Smith or Robinson, "'the most powerful inducement we could think of. "'Aye,' said Mr. Cazalet, and that was money,' answered the detective. "'Money. If these men left any relations, sisters, brothers, nephews, nieces, it's in the interest of these relations to come into the light 
for there's money awaiting them. That's well known. I had it noised abroad in the papers, and let it be freely talked of in town. But as I say, nobody's come along. I firmly believe now that these two hadn't a blood relation in the world. A queer thing, but it seems to be so. And this money, I asked, is it much? That was one of the first things I went for, answered Scarterfield. Naturally, when a man comes to the end, which Noah Quick met with, inquiries are made of his solicitors and his bankers. Noah had both in our parts. The solicitors knew nothing about him, except that he had employed them now and then in trifling matters, and that of late he had made a will, in which in brief fashion he left everything of which he died possessed to his brother Salter, whose address he gave as being the same as his own. About the same time they had made a will for Salter, in which he bequeathed everything he had to Noah. But as to the antecedents of Noah and Salter, nothing. Then I approached the bankers. There I got more information. When Noah Quick first went to Devonport, he deposited a considerable sum of money with one of the leading banks at Plymouth and at the time of his death he had several thousand pounds lying there to his credit. His bankers also had charge of valuable securities of his. On Salter Quick's coming to the Admiral Parker, Noah introduced him to this bank. Salter deposited there a sum of about two thousand pounds, and of that he had only withdrawn about a hundred. So he, too, at the time of his death, had a large balance. Also he left with the bankers for safekeeping some valuable scrip and securities, chiefly of Indian railways. Altogether those bankers hold a lot of money that belongs to the two brothers, and there are certain indications that they made their money, previous to coming to Devonport, in the Far East. But the bankers know no more of their antecedents than the solicitors do. In both instances, banking matters and legal matters, the two men seem to have confined their words to strict business, and no more. The only man I have come across who can give me the faintest idea of anything respecting their past is a regular frequenter of the Admiral Parker, who says that he once gathered from Salter Quick that he and Noah were natives of Rotherhithe, or somewhere in that part, and that they were orphans and the last of their lot. "'Of course you have been to Rotherhithe, making inquiries,' suggested Mr. Raven. "'I have, sir,' replied Scarterfield, "'and I searched various parish registers there, and found nothing that helped me. "'If the two brothers did live at Rotherhithe, "'they must have been taken there as children and born elsewhere. "'They weren't born in Rotherhithe Parish. "'Nor could I come across anybody at all "'who knew anything of them in seafaring circles thereabouts.' I came to the conclusion that whoever those two men were, and whatever they had been, most of their lives had been spent away from this country. Probably in the Far East, as you previously suggested, muttered Mr. Cazalet. Likely, agreed Scarterfield, their money would seem to have been made there, judging by, at any rate, some of their securities. Well, there's more ways than one of finding things out, and after I'd knocked round a good deal of Thames side, and had been in queer places, I turned my attention to Lloyd's. Now, connected with Lloyd's are various publications having to do with shipping matters. The weekly shipping index, the confidential index, for instance. Moreover, with time and patience, you can find out a great deal at Lloyd's, not only about ships, but about men in them. And to cut a long story short, gentlemen, Last week I did at last get a clue about Noah and Salter Quick, which I now mean to follow up for all it's worth. Here the detective, suddenly assuming a more business-like air than he had previously shown, paused, to produce from his breast pocket a small bundle of papers which he laid before him on the table. I suppose we all gazed at them as if they suggested deep and dark mystery but for the time being Scarterfield let them lie idle where he had placed them. "'I'll have to tell the story in a sort of sequence,' he continued. "'This is what I have pieced together from the information I collected at Lloyd's. 
in October 1907, now nearly five years ago, a certain steamship, the Elizabeth Robinson, left Hong Kong in southern China for Chemopo, one of the principal ports in Korea. She was spoken in the Yellow Sea several days later. After that, she was never heard of again, and according to the information available at Lloyd's, she probably went down in a typhoon in the Yellow Sea and was totally lost with all hands on board. No great matter, perhaps. From all that I could gather, she was nothing but a tramp steamer that did, so to speak, odd jobs anywhere between India and China. She had gone to Hong Kong from Singapore. Her owners were small folk in Singapore, and I imagine that she had seen a good deal of active service. All the same, she is of considerable interest to me, for I have managed to secure a list of the names of the men who were on her when she left Hong Kong for Chemopo, and amongst those names are those of the two men we're concerned about, Noah and Salter Quick. Scarterfield slipped off the India rubber band which had confined his papers, and selecting one, slowly unfolded it. Mr. Raven spoke. "'I understood that this ship, the Elizabeth Robinson, was lost with all hands,' he said. "'So she is set down at Lloyd's,' replied Scarterfield. "'Never heard of again, after being spoken in the Yellow Sea, about three days from Chemulpo. "'Yet Noah and Salter Quick were on her, and were living five years later,' suggested Mr. Raven. "'Just so, sir,' agreed Scarterfield dryly. Therefore, if Noah and Salter Quick were on her, and as they were alive until recently, either the Elizabeth Robinson did not go down in a typhoon or for any other reason, or the brothers Quick escaped. But here is the list of the men who were aboard her when she sailed from Hong Kong. She was, I have already told you, a low-down tramp steamer, evidently picking up a precarious living between one far eastern port and another a small vessel. Her list includes a master, or captain, and a crew of eighteen. I needn't trouble you with their names, except in two instances, which I'll refer to presently. But here are the names of Noah Quick, Salter Quick, set down as passengers. Passengers, not members of the crew. Nothing in the list of the crew strikes me but the two names I spoke of, and that I'll now refer to. The first name will have an interest for Mr. Middlebrook. It's Netherfield. Netherfield, I exclaimed. The name? That Salter Quick asked you particular questions about when he met you on the headlands, Mr. Middlebrook, answered Scarterfield with a knowing look, and that he was very anxious to get some news of William Netherfield, deckhand of Blythe, Northumberland, that's the name on the list of those who were aboard the Elizabeth Robinson when she went out of Hong Kong and disappeared for ever. Of Blythe, remarks Mr. Cassellet. Hmm, Blythe lied some miles to the southward. I'm aware of it, sir, said Scarterfield, and I propose to visit the place when I have made certain inquiries about this region. But I hope you appreciate the extraordinary coincidence, gentlemen. In October 1907, Salter Quick is on a tramp steamer in the Yellow Sea in company more or less intimate with a sailor man from Blythe in Northumberland, whose name is Netherfield. In March 1912, he is on the sea coast near Almouth, asking anxiously if anybody knows of a church or churchyards in these parts where people of the name of Netherfield are buried. Why? What had the man Netherfield who was with Salter Quick in Chinese waters in 1907, got to do with Salter Quick's presence here five years later. Nobody attempted to answer these questions, and presently I put one for myself. You spoke of two names on the list as striking you with some significance, I said. Netherfield is one. What is the other? That of a Chinaman, he replied promptly, referring to his documents set down as cook i'm told most of those coasting steamers in that part of the world carry chinamen as cooks chu fen that's the name and why it's significant to me when all the rest aren't is this during the course of my inquiries at lloyd's 
I learnt that about three years ago a certain Chinaman, calling himself Chu Fan, dropped in at Lloyd's and was very anxious to know if the steamer Elizabeth Robinson, which had sailed from Hong Kong for Chemulpo in October 1907, ever arrived at its destination. He was given the same information that was afforded me, and on getting it, went away silent. Now then, was this man, this Chinaman, the Chu Fun who turned up in London, the same Chu Fun who was on the Elizabeth Robinson? If so, how did he escape a shipwreck which evidently happened? And why, if there was no shipwreck, and something else took place of which we have no knowledge, did he want to know, after two years' lapse of time, if the ship did really get the Chemopo? There was a slight pause, then suddenly broken by Dr. Lorimore, who then spoke for the first time. "'Do you know what all this is suggesting to me?' he exclaimed, nodding at Scarterfield. "'Something happened on that ship. It may be that there was no shipwreck, as you said just now. Something may have taken place of which we have no knowledge. But one fact comes out clearly. Whether the Elizabeth Robinson ever reached any port or not, it's very evident, nay certain, that Noah and Salter Quake did. And, considering the inquiry he made at Lloyd's, so did the Chinaman, Chu Fen. Now, what could those three have told about the Elizabeth Robinson? No one made any remark on that until Scarterfield remarked softly. I wish I had chanced to be at Lloyd's when Chu Fun called there, but that's three years ago, and Chu Fun may be where. Something impelled Miss Raven and myself to glance at Dr. Lorimore. He nodded. He knew what we were thinking of, and he turned to Scarterfield. I happen, he said, to have a Chinaman in my employ at present, one wing a very clever man he has been with me for some years i brought him from india when i came home recently an astute chap like he paused suddenly the detective had turned a suddenly interested glance on him you live here about sir he asked i i don't think i've caught your name dr lorimore our neighbour said mr raven hurriedly close by I think Lorimore saw what had suddenly come into Scarterfield's mind. He laughed a little cynically. Don't get the idea or suspicion, formed or half-fledged, that my man Wing has anything to do with the murder of Salter Quick, he said. I can vouch for him and his movements. I know where he was on the night of the murder. What I was thinking of was this. Wing is a man of infinite resource and of superior brains. He might be of use to you in tracing this Chu Fun, if Chu Fun is in England. When Wing and I were in London, we were there for some time after I returned from India, previous to my coming down here, Wing paid a good many visits to his fellow Chinaman in the East End, Limehouse Way. He also had a holiday in Liverpool, and another at Swansea and Cardiff, where, I am told, there are Chinese settlements and I happen to know that he carries on an extensive correspondence with his compatriots. If you think he could give you any information, Mr. Scarterfield? I'd like to have a talk with him, certainly, responded the detective with some eagerness. I know a bit about these chaps. Some of them can see through a brick wall. Lorimore turned to Mr. Raven. If your coachman could run across with a dog-cart or anything handy, he said, and would tell Wing that I want him here, he'd be with me at once, and he may be able to suggest something. I know that before he came to me, I picked him up in Bombay, he had knocked about the ports of southern China a great deal. Come with me, and give my coachman instructions, said Mr. Raven. He'll run over to your place in ten minutes, and while we are discussing this affair, we may as well have as much light as we can get on it. He and Lorimore left the room together. When they returned, the conversation reverted to a discussion of possible ways and means of finding out more about the antecedents of the quicks. Half an hour passed in this fruitlessly. Then the door was quietly opened, and behind the somewhat pompous figure of the butler, 
I saw the bland, obsequious smile of the Chinaman. End of chapter 10